Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. On this cloudy day, our message is to be holy. Two words. Be holy. It's from 1 Peter, the first chapter. In those verses, he talks about being holy. Many biblical scholars have said that the Apostle Peter wrote this particular letter just before the, the big fire in Rome, which occurred uh, in 64 AD. And of course, Nero used the Christians to blame them for the fire so that he could exterminate them and get rid of as many Christians as he could. So this letter was written to brand new Christians around that time, 64 AD. They were scattered around a wide geographic area that we know we knew back then as Asia Minor, but today it's Turkey. Where Turkey is today, this is where this letter was sent. That general geographic area to encourage new Christians to tell them about the problems that they faced and how to try to overcome some of those problems. And it's important to us today because we face similar problems. The basic problem was how to live a holy life in a society that's basically hostile to Christianity or to holiness or the concept of holiness. How do we live a holy life? How are we supposed to be holy in a society that's rampant with selfishness and idolatry and all sorts of things? God has a plan for every single one of our lives. Each one of us, believe it or not, each one of us is precious in God's sight. He looks at you and he says, you know what? You are a work of excellence. Whether we agree with it or not. It's a wonderful thing to know that we're loved so much by Almighty God. That's what we try to, to proclaim every Sunday, the good news. God loves you. We always quote that scripture. Everybody, it's the most popular scripture in the Bible. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. The world. The world. And he gave only the God of God that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Amen. Amen. Y'all didn't need no help on that one. Praise the Lord. John chapter 3, verse 16. Praise God. Amen. <laughs> we can't understand the enormity of God's love because we're not God. We didn't make ourselves. He made us. He created us. Psalm 139. It talks about, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. He loves you. He wants you to know that he loves you in spite of what's happening in the world today. He says, be holy because I am holy. That's from the book of Leviticus. <sighs> Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44. Peter is quoting that verse of scripture. Although, and I'll read it to you, verse 44. It says, I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. Leviticus 11, verse 44. He says, do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves along the ground. So it has more of a reference to the things that you eat, the things that you, uh, who you are not supposed to associate with. The Jews had strict rules about not mingling with Gentiles. And if you read in the book of Acts, chapter 10, Peter was urged by the Holy Spirit to go and preach to a non-Jew, a, a Roman centurion by the name of Cornelius in chapter 10. And Peter doesn't want to go. He sees a vision, and the vision is all kinds of food on this, on this tablecloth that comes from heaven. And he's seeing all these wild animals, and a voice says, kill and eat, Peter. He said, no, I don't do that. 
Come on, Lord. I've never eaten anything unclean. And then the voice goes back, to, speaks back to Peter and says, that which God has cleansed, let no one call unclean. And it happens three times, three times. And then all of a sudden the sheet is taken back up into heaven. Read it in Acts chapter 10. And then, right then, the Holy Spirit tells Peter, speaks directly to Peter while he's on this rooftop and says, go with these men. These men have come to, to find you. Go with them. Don't hesitate. Go with them because I have a mission for you. Follow them and you'll see what it's all about. So Peter goes and he is brought to Cornelius' house. And it's at that time that Peter finally realizes what God wants all of us to know. And that is that God is no respecter of persons. He loves all of us, old, young, tall, short, <laughs> whatever we are. Our backgrounds, he loves all of us, praise God. And he says that you should not hesitate to go with them. And then all of a sudden Peter says in chapter 11, chapter 10 of Acts, he says, now I see God is no respecter of persons. And he starts to tell them the good news about Jesus. And just as he's preaching the gospel to them, they all get baptized with the Holy Spirit. It's a fabulous story. They're, they're just sitting there. The whole place is crowded. All of Cornelius' family is there. And they get the gift of, gift of speaking in tongues. God wants us to know that he loves us. And he wants us to love one another. And that's a little bit later in my message. But let's study for a moment together what Peter is trying to tell us. He tells us that God is our Father, and He's also our Judge. He has these dual roles. That reminds me of an interesting story. There was a story I heard a preacher tell one time about an airplane ride they were taking, some people were taking, and, and uh, the, the pilot came on the loudspeaker and said, we're going to hit some turbulence, we just want you to be prepared. It's going to be very bumpy for a while. And, just sit tight, we're going to get through it, it's going to be very turbulent. Well, it was. It was very turbulent. And people were getting scared. They were, have you ever been in, in turbulence? Anybody ever fly? <laughs> you know, so you kind of know what it's like. It's a little scary sometimes. Sometimes it's crazy because, you know, it, it's really, you, you can hear thunder and you're up in the clouds and you hear this thunder. It just scares you. Well, at any rate, everybody in the plane was scared crazy, except one little girl. She just sat there all calm, just going through a little booklet and coloring and things. And somebody noticed her, and at the end of the flight, everybody was so thankful that they got there safely and sound. Their, their, their nerves were shaken and so forth and so on. But one of the passengers asked the little girl, they said, how come you weren't? You, you didn't seem scared at all. She says, well, I... I know the pilot, he's my dad. <laughs> <laughs> and we need to know our father. I don't subscribe to this, to me personally. I don't like the idea of calling God daddy. I'm not, I'm not into daddy. I think he needs to be held up a little bit more reverently. So I call him father, as Jesus said. But I understand when people do it. They, they, they mean well. I like our Father who art in heaven. I'm old school, amen? amen. And so, um, we need to know, if we had that kind of faith, can you imagine a little girl not, not faced by anything? I know the pie, he's my dad. Well, we know Almighty God, he's our Father in heaven. And he wants us to trust him. And one of the ways that we get to know him better is to understand that one of his important characteristics, and he has many characteristics, but one of his most important characteristics, besides love, is his holiness. In order to start living a life that's holy, we need to see God as our Father. And as the prayer goes, our Father, hallowed. Holy, hallowed be thy name. We're to take his name seriously.
And he's encouraging each of us to be, become more and more like our Heavenly Father so that we become more totally devoted and, and dedicated to the things of God rather than the things of ourselves. In Romans chapter 12, there's a whole book I think both of us have probably read years ago by Dr. R.C. Sproul. The late Dr. R.C. Sproul wrote this book years ago, The Holiness of God. It's a great book if you ever get a chance to read it. And I know that R.C. Sproul quoted this very verse, Romans chapter 12. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. We have to, in order to become holy and live more in the holiness of God, we've got to renew our minds. The word transformed is the Greek word metamorpho. Metamorpho, we get the word metamorphosis. You know what that means. Metamorphosis is a change. It's a transformation. Now this is a little gruesome, but how many of you have heard of Franz Kafka? The writer. Amen. All right, thank you, you three. In the back, <laughs> praise the Lord. He wrote a book. He wrote a book called Metamorphosis. I, I don't recommend it. I'm not advocating, but it is interesting because if you know the story, it's about this salesman who one day wakes up and instead of being a human being, he realizes that he's an insect. That's a real transformation. And then he has to make adjustments as to what it's like. It's a little silly, but anyway. The idea of metamorphosis is a change. It's a transformation. I guess a better example, I probably shouldn't have used that one, but a better example is, is, is the butterfly. The butterfly lays the, the eggs, and the, the egg turns into a, a caterpillar, right? And we see the caterpillar opening up and then becomes a new butterfly. That's a good one, right? All right, praise the Lord. Thank you. And that's what Jesus is trying to say to Nicodemus. If you want to really be holy, you've got to become born again. And Nicodemus doesn't get it. But Jesus is explaining that that which is of the flesh is flesh, but that which is of the spirit is spirit. And we are, all of us, are spiritual beings that are encased in human bodies. We're all spiritual beings, and when we die, our bodies will be buried, but we, our spirit will be with the Lord. And then one day, one day, our, our spirit will join in our new bodies, and we'll have a brand new body, and we won't look 70, 80, 90 years old. We'll be back to being 30 again. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, I like that one too. Have more hair again. <laughs> it's painful when you see him just running away from you. <laughs> no, come back. <laughs> so anyway, Jesus said, you must be born again. <clears throat> so at any rate, I'm gonna, I want to just throw out three points. And they all begin with C, the letter C. Just so you know, there's so much to this. I can't capture all this in one message. There's so much. I just want to give you a couple of tidbits that have to do with drawing us closer to the holiness of God. And the first thing is, Change. Number one is change your perspective. Instead of thinking the way we have always thought, we need to remember that we need to renew our minds in the way that God wants us to renew them. We can't get so caught up in this world that this is the only thing we, we think about. We make this world our priority. There's another priority, and that priority is Jesus Christ. He really is the Son of God, by the way. Whether we believe it or not, He really is Lord. And there really is a heaven. And one day, we're going to be there with Him. And I can tell you right now, there's not one hearse in Hingham that's going to be able to bring all your stuff to heaven. There's, there's never been a hearse that can 
be like a U-Haul that can follow the hearse to heaven. God takes us as we are in the, the twinkling of an eye. We're with him in spirit. Praise God. Job said, naked I came into this world and naked I will leave. So the change has to take place with renewing our minds and we re recognize that we're not just physical, but we're spiritual beings. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, it says, For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. That's a lot of words, but what, it's, what Paul is saying is that there are things in this world we don't know, we don't have any clue about. But one day, we're going to know everything. We're going to know how we were formed. We're going to know who our great, great, great ancestors were. We're going to know so many things in heaven that we would never... I would love to know my, my ancestry from 200 years ago. But you know, there were records that weren't kept, so what can I say? But we will know all when we're with him in that day. So the first thing is to change our perspective. And we change our perspective by looking at God as our Father, by understanding that He loves us, that He has a plan for our lives, that He wants to live inside of us. And we change our perspective where the world is not the priority, but the Word of God is the priority. And we spend time every day feasting and meditating on the Word of God. That's the first point. Second point begins with a C. Complete commitment. That's two C's, but I, you know. Make a commitment. It takes work to work towards holiness. It's not something that just happens like that. It's something that we have to make a commitment to. It's much easier when we commit ourselves to the Lord. and Because God knows that we're not going to be perfect. He knows that we're going to make mistakes. I, I made a mistake in the, in the thing this morning. I, I jumped in the, I didn't was wondering why Matthew was laughing at me, because you know, I, I started playing the, the piece too soon. It ha we all make mistakes, but God is so gracious. He doesn't look at you with your mistakes, he looks at you as a work of notable excellence. Remember that. So when we make the commitment to him, the Bible says that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. He will reward us when we diligently seek Him. That's why I believe in the power of prayer. I was telling someone when I prayed with Dr. Stanley that time in Atlanta, Georgia, many years ago, and the doctors gave Mama two weeks. And I got to meet him. I prayed. He prayed. We held hands. We joined some of his deacons, surrounded us, and we prayed together. And Mama lived about two more years. Praise God. Two years. I'll take those two years. It's a lot better than two weeks. Amen. And I thank God that there is power in prayer. I know for myself, and some of you, many of you know for yourself, keep praying, don't give up. Stay at it. Stay steadfast. Believe God, because he does hear those prayers. Heaven is real, and Jesus Christ is Lord, and he loves you. And he says that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Striving for God's holiness is a daily commitment. First, it's changing our mind, our attitude, but it's also a daily commitment. We have to commit to doing it so that when we stumble, when we fall, when things don't go our way, we can pick ourselves back up and get on the right track. And one of the other ways that we're able to do it is remembering a, a practice of someone that I greatly admired, um, he lived from 1614 to 1691, Brother Lawrence from France. And he wrote a treatise, one of the most profound treatises I've ever read. It talks about practicing the presence of God. If I can just take a few minutes to read some of the excerpts from his treatise. It's not long. He says, when we are faithful to keep ourselves in his holy presence, it means he's talking about practicing the presence. Imagine his presence with you all the time. Not just think, okay, I'm talking to God, he's way up there. No, he's with you. He says this, when we are faithful to keep ourselves in his holy presence and set him always before us, 
This hinders our offending him and doing anything that may displease him. It also begets in us a holy freedom. And if I may so speak of familiarity with God, where, when we ask, he supplies the graces we need. Over time, by often repeating these acts, they become habitual. And the presence of God becomes quite natural to us. So the first point is change your perspective. Change your mind, your renewing of your mind. And then the second is a commitment. Make a commitment to prayer so that you can follow in the footsteps of God's holiness. And then number three, the third point, begins with a C, is to care about everybody, not just the ones who are close to you. Care about everyone impartially. Care. G.K. Chesterton once said, one sees great things from the valley, only small things from the peak. It's when we go down in the valley with other people. Amen. It's when we go down into the valley with others that we begin to learn empathy toward others. We begin to learn sensitivity towards their feelings. It's when we get down in the valley with others who are hurting that we learn the holiness of God. God loves the sinner. Paul talked about it. He said, while we were still sinners, Jesus gave his life for all of us. He came down in this valley called earth to give himself as a ransom for us so that we would become more obedient to the things of God. And so he wants us to embody that love. And I use the word, the letter C, just to keep us on, on track here with just caring about others. I love verse 22 where Peter says, now that you have been you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other. Love one another deeply. That's in verse 22. Love one another deeply from the heart. Don't just say, I love you. Love them from your heart. Really, truly love one another. That's one of the things that I'm so proud about with all the mission work that many of you do. You love them. It's not just perfunctory. It's something from the heart. Many of you are involved in, in other kinds of forms of ministry, caring for seniors, caring for this group, caring for that, caring for people who are disabled. And you do it from your heart. Nobody had to make you do it. Nobody could pay you enough money. You do it from your heart. That's what God wants us to continue doing. And those of you who've never started, let's get going on it. Let's do it. Let's start reaching out to someone that we can care for. Those three points are the points that I want to make. He is no respecter of persons. He loves everybody. He wants us to make a change. He wants us to make a commitment. And he wants us to care. I remember visiting Germany where my father was serving the United States government many years and the wall had just come down and I met dad's secretary and talked with her and talked with other people who worked for him years ago in the 1960s and he told me all these incredible stories and you know I hadn't really been that close to dad during that particular time in my life because I've been living in Boston and you know he'd been serving the government in Africa and South Africa and Germany and Greece and all that. And so he had just moved to D.C. and I said, Dad, I just want you to know that I was in Berlin and I, I, had, I had heard all these stories. I met your secretary. And she told me all the sacrifices that you made for them while they were struggling in, in Berlin and so forth and so on. And I said, I'm very proud of you. And, and I said, I just want you to know I haven't really been in touch with you that much. I'm sorry, but I just want you to know something. I love you. There was a hesitation like I've never heard. And then Dad got up, he said, uh, he kind of gulped. He said, um, well, the, 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 
feeling is mutual. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, our folks, that, gen that great generation, they, they didn't display a lot of emotion. Amen. Some of you know what I'm talking about. I still, ne I still never forgot that. Well, the feeling is mutual. Well, once the kids came along, he started saying, I love you a lot more. I love you. The kids, granddaddy, I love you. I love you. One of the greatest feelings. I'm so happy for you going down to see the, the granddaughters in Colorado. It is the grandest feeling in the world to be able to have your, your grandchildren say, granddaddy, grandma, nana, I love you. We love you. You know, it's, it's just unbelievable. It's great. And so what I'm saying is that other people will also appreciate the love that you offer to one another, whether they're close or whether they're not close. God is no respecter of persons. So I'm going to wrap this up quickly. A couple of verses. Read your scriptures. And the Psalms are great. I want to give you one quote from Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All that is within me praise his holy name. His name is holy. Remember his holiness. I hope this has been an encouragement. Make that change to become more holy. Make a commitment to become more holy. And show caring for others, which will also enable you to exemplify the holiness of God. Two more scriptures and then we're done. Psalm 29. That Tom read this morning. Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty or the splendor of his holiness. He's holy. And then the last one, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 17. It says, for God's temple is sacred and you, you together are that temple. Did you know that? Your bodies are holy. Your temple is holy to God. Praise the Lord. He loves each of us. And we're not here just for ourselves. We're here to help and make a difference in the lives of someone else. Amen? Amen. Father God, we thank you. We love you. We bless your name. We thank you so much for showing us, Lord, exemplifying holiness in our lives. And Father, we just praise you. We bless your name. And ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Number 472.